The plan today is to take a look at the standard enthalpy change of combustion. We're going to have a look at how we can calculate it from experimental data, issues with the experiment, and also the concept of energy density for fuels. So first of all, let's take a look at the shorthand, delta C H bus stop sign. What does this actually mean? Well, capital Greek D there, delta, stands for change in, because we can't measure the enthalpy of a substance directly, but we can measure the enthalpy change. What is enthalpy change? It's the heat transfer, either exothermically or endothermically during a reaction. Little c here is for combustion. So this is going to change depending on the reaction we're having a look at. The H stands for enthalpy. Uh, my bus stop sign indicates that we are working in standard conditions. And my standard conditions are 298K, 100 kilopascals, so atmospheric pressure. And if I have any solutions, they would be at one mole per decimeter cubed. So let's have a look at the definition. Standard enthalpy of combustion is the enthalpy change when one mole of a substance completely reacts with oxygen under standard conditions with reactants and products being in their standard states. And like all enthalpy changes, it refers to a stated equation. Now, this one mole of substance is really important because when we write an equation for a reaction, let's say we are looking at the combustion of ethane, so C2H6, gas reacting with oxygen, complete combustion to make carbon dioxide and water. I have two carbons, so I'm going to make two carbon dioxide. Six hydrogens makes three waters, which means that I will need three and a half O2. Now, it's really important that I don't double up because my definition is for one mole of my substance being combusted. So my ethane needs to be one mole and everything needs to be balanced from that. Enthalpy of combustion under standard conditions for this reaction is minus 1,561 kilojoules per mole. And obviously negative there because it's an exothermic reaction. Heat is going to be moving from the system. So the system here is the combustion reaction into the surroundings. So as far as the system's concerned, it's losing energy and the surroundings are gaining it. And this is the heat transfer that we're measuring. It's a common exam question to be asked to write an equation to represent a definition. And we need to be very clear about our state symbols. This is where students often lose marks. We are reacting with oxygen under standard conditions with reactants and products being in their standard states. Well, at room temperature and pressure, water is a liquid. So it's really important that we indicate it as a liquid with our state symbols. Let's take a moment to compare two fuels. I've got enthalpy of combustion data here for hydrogen and for ethanol, which is an alcohol. And at face value, it would seem that ethanol is a better choice of fuel. It releases far more heat in terms of the mole of alcohol burnt compared with hydrogen, so minus 1367 versus minus 286. However, this is per mole. It doesn't take into account how many molecules there are in a mole, and that of course depends on the molar mass of the molecule in question. So this is where the concept of energy density comes in. And often fuels are compared in terms of their energy density, which is quoted in kilojoules per gram or kilojoules per kilogram. And let's have a look at this and we'll see why. So if I want to calculate the energy density for hydrogen, so let's take hydrogen as our first example here. We know that it produces minus 286 kilojoules per mole of hydrogen combusted. Now, if I want an energy density in kilojoules per kilogram, 
one kilogram equals a thousand grams. And the molar mass of hydrogen is two. So if I want to calculate the energy density, the first thing I need to do is work out how many moles of hydrogen are there in a kilogram. So number of moles of hydrogen is going to equal mass over molar mass, 1,000 divided by 2, which equals 500. So the energy density for hydrogen as a fuel is going to equal minus 286 times 500, which is 143,000 kilojoules per kilogram. Now let's compare this with ethanol. So C2H5OH. Once again, if I'm working with a kilogram, I need to work out how many moles I've got. Molar mass of ethanol is 46. I should probably put the units in before, grams per mole. So the number of moles in a kilogram is 1,000 divided by 46. And then if I multiply that by the number of kilojoules per mole, it's enthalpy of combustion, 1367. The answer comes up 29717 kilojoules per kilogram. So it would seem that hydrogen is actually a far more efficient fuel per kilogram than ethanol. In fact, it is the most efficient fuel that we have. And this is really important where weight is a consideration. For example, rocket fuel, where the number of kilos and the amount of energy we get per kilo of fuel um, is, is vitally important. We can determine enthalpy of combustion for a fuel in the lab in a quite a simple way. I'm sure this is an experiment that you have done. The method is in all good textbooks. And this is an experiment you need to know for A-level. You'll be expected to be able to write this out as a method. So our fuel is in the spirit burner. We've got that down here. And clamped above the spirit burner, we've got a beaker of water. And there is a known volume of water in this beaker. So for example, say 150 centimetres cubed. We've got thermometer because we are going to need to measure the temperature change and a draft shield. So we've got some kind of very, very elementary sort of insulation. And the spirit burner is positioned so that there is not that much space between the flame and the beaker because we want the heat energy from the fuel, from burning the fuel, to be transferred into the water because by using the heat energy to raise the temperature of the water, we can then get a feel for how much heat energy was released. So let's have a look at a sample calculation here. Calculate enthalpy combustion for methanol from the exper following experimental data. Now, we're going to measure the spirit burner before and after the experiment. And that way we know how much fuel is burnt. So maybe that we light our burner and we burn it for two minutes, five minutes. Um, so we get a decent temperature change. Obviously, the bigger the temperature change, the less error there is in the readings. We need the volume of water, the initial temperature and the final temperature of the water. And when we're doing this experimentally, we need to be very clear that we wait until the temperature stops rising. So where are we going to start? The first thing we need to know is how much heat is transferred from the burning fuel to the water. So heat transfer is the value Q and Q equals MCAT. And this is an equation that you're expected to know. So Q is the heat in joules. M is the mass. Now, not the mass of the fuel, but the mass of the water. The energy is going from the fuel into the water. So the mass of the water. Now, I know I've got 150 centimetres cubed of water. And we know that a water has um, a density of one gram per centimetres cubed. 
So 150 centimeters cubed is to all intents and purposes 150 grams. C is the specific heat capacity. This is given to you. So the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water by one Kelvin. And for water, it's 4.18 joules per Kelvin per gram. And delta T is the temperature change. Now, technically, this should be in Kelvin. But since a one degree change in Kelvin is the same as a one degree change in degree C, we don't need to bother changing it over to Kelvin. So let's plug this in. Q is going to equal the mass, 150, times 4.18, times the temperature change. If we go back to our results, the difference between 17.5 and 39, and that is 21.5 degrees. Plug that into our calculator, and it comes out at 13480.5 joules. So this is the amount of heat transferred by a certain mass of methanol that was burnt. And we can figure that out if we take 187.9 from 189.3. That comes to be 1.4 grams. So 1.4 grams gives us 13480.5 joules. That's not really very helpful because we like to standardize things. What we really want is an answer in kilojoules per mole. That's what the units tell us. So to work out number of moles of methanol, so moles of methanol is going to equal mass over molar mass. So that's 1.4, and the molar mass for methanol is 32. So now we're getting somewhere, 0.0438 moles. So this is how much fuel we actually burnt. So I can scale it up. If I know how much energy I get from 0.0438 moles, I can figure out how much I'm going to get for one mole. I want my answer in kilojoules per mole. So scaling up, one divided by 0.0438, multiplied by the amount of energy, 13480.5, comes to 308125 joules per mole. And then to convert that to kilojoules, all I need to do is divide by 1,000. So 308.1 kilojoules per mole. Now, the next thing before we leave our answer, we need to appreciate that energy was lost from the system, the spirit burner burning the fuel, to the surroundings. In this case, hopefully most of it was trapped by the water. So it's an exothermic reaction. And it's our job to appreciate that and put in the minus sign. If it were an endothermic reaction, you would put in a plus sign. You wouldn't just leave it blank because the examiner needs to be convinced that you know what you're talking about. So by our experiment, when we burn methanol, we get a value of enthalpy of combustion of minus 308.1 kilojoules per mole. If you look this up in the data book, under standard conditions, we should get minus 726 kilojoules per mole. Clearly, this is not a very good experiment. So where has it gone wrong? First problems are loss of heat. Most of the heat does not actually go into the water, where we're actually measuring the heat transfer. It's lost to the surroundings, to the air, and to heating up the beaker itself. Our second problem is incomplete combustion of the fuel. When we're burning our fuel in air, then not all of the carbon is converted to carbon dioxide. Some of it's converted to, well, carbon monoxide, and some of it is just left as carbon, particulate matter. And we see that as soot on the bottom of the beaker. If you've done this experiment, you get very sooty hands indeed. So heat loss to the surroundings, incomplete combustion of the fuel. 
We're not working under completely standard conditions, although often that's an answer that they don't particularly like. It's a bit of a cop-out in the exam. The third real reason is evaporation of fuel from the wick. So if we think about this experiment, once we have finished heating up our water, we cap the spirit burner to put the flame out. But because it's hot, fuel is still going to travel up the wick and it just evaporates. So what that means is that when we re-weigh our spirit burner, it weighs a little less than it should. We are assuming more fuel has been burnt than it actually has. So how are we going to overcome this? Well, the solution is something called a bomb calorimeter. In a bomb calorimeter, our fuel or the sample, whatever we're combusting, is placed in what they call a bomb. And this is built from steel. It's designed to withstand great pressures. So the volume remains constant during the experiment. We have um, a thermometer. And it's, I uh, can't really fit that in, a thermometer. It's a digital thermometer. So we get a very, very precise reading that we can read it to plus or minus 0 0.0001 degree C. When the sample is combusted, heat is transferred into the water. The water is stirred, so we get um, an even temperature rise. And the water itself is inside an insulated jacket so that we are doing everything possible to minimize heat loss. So what happens is that the sample is burnt in pure oxygen. So the sample burnt in oxygen rather than air. So we're going to get complete combustion, not incomplete combustion. And the heat released, as I've said, is used to heat up this known volume of water inside an insulated jacket, so we get a far more accurate reading. If this has been useful, hit the subscribe button, the effortless way to support your studies. And by clicking the link in the blurb below, it will take you straight to the Crunch Chemistry School, where you'll find all the resources you need to get that A-star grade at A-level. Together, we can do this.